uh, if you don't hear it, turn off the video. Um, and um, still learning about telling stories on this piece of land here. Um, we're he at here in Ukiah, um, California, in Southern Poma Territory, and what this place needs. But I just send out my greetings to this creek that has started running today in the last few days with this big pouring of rain. Um, that that we that, that like my words can join the water in this watershed and, and populate the whole ecology with blessing. And um, that that something in you came for something and I hope you find it or something akin to it in what happens tonight. And send my, my greeting out to the ash trees on the creek and I send my greetings and my blessings out to my child Rowan sleeping. Hope he catches it, some of it in his dreams. And I'm just grateful for everything that got you here and got me here. Um, yeah, grateful for my teachers, teachers in flesh, like people like Martin Shaw and Andreas Cornball, um, and teachers in, in, in books like Danny Deardorff and, um, and Mal Domasome and Malcolm Geit and Thomas Mallory. Um, and and my, my greetings way back, the last thing I'll say, I just send my greetings and my gratitude way back to my like sixth or seventh great uncle, whose name was Edward Strachey, who in 1868 uh, translated Thomas Mallory's La Morte de Arthur from Old Middle English to Modern English and was a scholar of the Arthurian who I just found out about two days ago. So thank you for showing up. Thank you for being here. Grateful that I heard this call and that I'm doing it. And with that, um, are you ready to hear a story? Yeah, yes. I'm ready to hear a story. So once, once upon a time, once upon a time, once in a time like now, because all time is once upon, upon a time time, if you listen to the Irish mystic John Moriarty, all time is once upon a time time. Once in a time like that, Arthur, king of Camelot, Camelot the Golden, uh, had the whole bustling hedgerow of his knights around him. The, the, the fellowship and the warmth of, of this round table fellowship was strong and mighty. And, and, and into that, and into that vessel, into that place, into that beauty, um, cracks started to, to make their way. Cracks started to make their way because anything that is made to address a chaos and a disorder will ha has a debt to pay. And so once when Arthur was away from his throne room, in his throne room stood Sir Gawain and his brother Sir Gaheris and Sir Gareth. And to them came Sir Mordred and Sir Mordred and Sir Agravain. And these knights gathered in the throne room of King Arthur without him present, speaking over the throne at each other. And they bantered and they played back and forth, as was the way in this brotherhood, in this fellowship of knights. And at some point, the conversation turned and uh, what a green light, this like green light came into, into Sir Mordred's eyes. And Sir Mordred 
said to Sir Gawain, I know you know about Sir Lancelot and the Queen Guinevere. I know you know about the love that they have and the actions that they take of com consummating that love behind the back of the king. And Agravain chimes in, just agreeing, supporting Mordred's claim that everyone knows this is happening. And Sir, Sir, Sir Gawain, Sir Gawain, it's a Welsh English thing is going, Sir Gawain goes back and says to him, stop, stop, I will not hear what you're saying. I will not have you bring noise against Lancelot in my presence. Isn't it true that Lancelot has saved both the king and the queen from peril again and again, the best knight in the realm? Sir, Lan Sir Mordred, you were in the prison. You were in prison and Lancelot came and saved you along with 200 knights. How, could, how dare you utter falsity? about Lancelot and the queen in my presence. I'm leaving. Gowan gets up to go and his brothers, G Gareth and Gaheris, who were both knighted by Lancelot, give similar protestation and leave. Just so happened that 12 other knights were sitting around in the room at this moment, not engaged in this direct conversation over the throne, but hearing these challenges brought forth and they all agreed that someone had to tell the king so sir gowan might not want to hear it sir gowan might not think we should tell the king and think nothing of it but we should tell the king it's important that he knows about this so when arthur came back into the throne room from doing whatever he was doing they unfolded to him their story. It's impossible, Arthur, that you don't know that your best friend, Sir Lancelot, is sleeping with your wife. Can't you see the way they look at each other in the mead hall? <laughs> Can't you see the sparks that fly off the anvil of their meeting? It is apparent to everyone except for you that this is what's happening. Arthur says, well, it is dangerous to bring noise against a knight such as Lancelot, who has saved me again and again from peril, and has saved Guinevere again and again from peril. I, to bring this noise against him in public, whether or not I, we believe it to be true, is to pit the greatest knight in the world against us. And I refuse to lose my friend and my brother. And so Mordred's tongue becomes sharper and he begins to just needle in on this, this uh, infidelity, this breaking of trust. Don't you? We have to do something. This is wrong. Lancelot needs to pay. Guinevere needs to pay. We need to prove that they're wrong. And at some point, this king, this great king, with all of his grace and his dignity, stoops down to the level of listening to Mordred, releasing that trust of love and brotherhood, releasing that commitment that he has to the fellowship between of the whole realm, and I think in some ways releasing the commitment to that type of courtly love that we talk about with Tristan and Isolde that he doesn't have access to, but he allows to flourish in his kingdom. In these stories, there's something that can happen in a relationship like Lancelot and Guinevere's that isn't possible in the relationship like Arthur and Guinevere's. And he loves that, I think, in some way. But he stoops and he lets Mordred convince him to go hunting that night. And at dusk, to send word back to Guinevere, I will not be coming home tonight. This hunt is going very well. I'm gonna spend time in the woods, in the dark, chasing whatever beasts decide to arise. And that is what I will do tonight. And to send this word back and that Mordred and Agravain and their 12 companions will wait for the, what they believe is the in, uh, inevitable 
which is that Lancelot will come to will be summoned to Queen Queen Guinevere where Queen Guinevere's room, and they will catch them in the act. So Arthur goes hunting. Lancelot, Lancelot's like, can I come with you? <laughs> like, I haven't gone hunting in a long time. We've been out questing. Lancelot has just come back from his um, attempt to find the Holy Grail. He's like, I'm going to go with my best friend out hunting. And Arthur shoes him away. No, no, no. This is a, this is a me, this is a me trip. I'm going hunting. And so, 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 the night deepens and or the the twilight arrives and the night begins to deepen and King Arthur sends back word to Queen Guinevere, you know, I'm not coming back tonight. I'm gonna stay out. The woods, the hunting is good. And in response to that, she indeed does send word to Sir Lancelot to come and visit her in her chamber. And now the sources disagree about what this was about. So who knows? We'll leave it up. But Guinevere goes to Lancelot's chamber, or Lancelot goes to Guinevere's chamber, and um, and in nothing but his plain clothes, and he leaves his sword behind. He goes alone in nothing but his plain clothes to Queen Guinevere's chamber and enters, and uh, she and they and they begin to converse and to connect. They have this deep bond, these two people, and converse and connect and uh, go over the old adventures that they've shared. And um, and just as the conversation's getting good, there's a just pounding at the door. Um, Sir Lancelot, we know you're in there. You're a traitor. You're being the queen and, the qu and Guinevere. Your infidelity proves you to be a traitor. Come on out. We've come for you, and all twelve knights have surged the door and are attempting to break it down. And Lancelot says, no, "Let me come out. We can talk about it. Like you don't know what's happening. Like we're in here talking." And they say, "No, you, you must pay. You will die, and the queen will be burned for your inf infidelity. And there's no way out of it. We've caught you in the act." And he says, "Well, I don't even." He looks down, he has no armor, and he has no sword. He turns to Guinevere and says, do you have, is there any armament in this room? Do you have some hidden piece of armor, some sword, something? Something, because if I go out there, I will die. It's obvious that they're here for blood. She says, no, I have nothing to give you. You have to meet this this way. And they both weep for having to meet this situation in this way. And Lancelot promises that if he can escape, that he'll come back and, to save her from whatever her fate is. And as he opens the door, he gets this kind of wicked cunning idea. And he lets someone, one of the knights, charge in to attack him. And he hits him over the head and slams the door at the same time. And he sprawls out. And he takes the armor of this unconscious knight and takes his sword. And Guinevere, who they say um, is fair and fell as a fey woman, can you just imagine what it would be like to have a queen of fairies don armor upon you to go and meet your certain death with 12 knights waiting outside the door for you? Like, that's this moment. That's this. She is, she is like all of this power. And he is just so feeble. <laughs> this greatest knight in the world is feeble at this moment. Cunning, but feeble. Until he has his armor put on by the queen of the fairies in this moment, right? And um, she, he puts on his armor and he just, again, makes the promise, I will come back for you. If I survive this, I will come back. You will not die from these false accusations. And he leans in and they kiss. He kisses her. And, and the descriptions of the kiss are just so elaborate and illustrious. This is like deep, loving connection in the face of doom. And whether or not it was the first time or the last time is unclear. But he opens the door and he 
fights like like a demon, they say in the text. He fights like a demon his way through all 12 of these knights. And all of them are killed, except for Sir Mordred, who he slashes once across the thigh. And somehow Sir Mordred is able to slink away into the shadows and disappear. So Lancelot has left this blood trail through the halls of Camelot in the most intimate, and while the king is away in the most intimate heart of the kingdom. And he runs to his room and he meets up with his cousin, Sir Bors, and they make a plan to help Lancelot escape to his castle, the Joyous Guard, where he will plan to come back to save Guinevere just in case they do sentence her to death. And so he escapes in the night to the Joyous Guard, his castle, and awaits news. And when Arthur returns, Mordred slinks back out of the shadows and unfolds the news. We caught Lancelot and Guinevere in the act. And then Lancelot, on top of it, killed 12 knights. He killed your cousin, Sir Agravain, my brother. He must pay. And Guinevere must pay too. And the only way the realm will respect you now that they know about this infidelity because he's been spreading the secrets is for her to be burned publicly at the stake. And Arthur weeps to lose his friend who's now gone to his castle and weeps again to lose Guinevere and he acquiesces to this plan. And so they set up this huge spectacle. And in the setting up the spectacle, he goes to Gowan. And he says, Gowan, you, because you defended Lancelot against me, and it's proven that he is false, you have to be the one to uh, escort Guinevere to the pyre. And Gowan refuses. He says, I refuse. I refuse to be privy to this. I refuse to be your accomplice in this hateful act on no evidence of infidelity and walks out. And he says, as he's walking out, I know that my brothers Gareth and Geharis would refuse you too if they were only a little bit older and knew how to say no to the king. Because in the next thing he does is turn to these two young knights who are longing for acceptance and tell them, you're going to have to do it. And the thing they say to him is, we will do it. And it will grieve us to do it, but we refuse to carry our swords while we're doing it. We'll leave our swords behind. And so the day arrives, and Geharis and Gareth are escorting Queen Guinevere through the cr crowds of people who have gathered for this spectacle, with Sir Mordred and all of the other knights of the round table accompanying them. And true to his promise, ever true to his word, it's said that Lancelot never broke a vow. He rides in with a host of knights and breaks up this chicane. He's like, this is not going down, and begins to just slice through his brothers, your brother, this brotherhood, to like kill his best friends in the world and battle against them. And in that, in the fury, the bloodlust of defending Guinevere and breaking up this um, burning, uh, Geharis and Gareth both fall to his sword in the same way that they were knighted by his sword in the first place. They fall to his sword in his blindness to, to, to break this up. And he gets Guinevere grabs Guinevere, and rides away back to the jo joyous guard with her, his ca the castle that he is the lord of in Logres. Well, you can imagine this is a pretty, like, this kind of shook the foundations of the whole system for a moment, just 
rocking everything out of order, and Arthur fell into just the dark, the darkness of avenging in this moment. The grief was so overwhelming to see his cousins, Gareth and Gaheris, who beloved Lancelot, dead there, and all of these other knights who were his brothers in some way, that he fell into the rage and revenge. But his one point of remaining in his sovereignty was to try and hide the truth from Gawain that Lancelot had killed his brothers. Because he knew, in some part of him, Arthur knew that it wasn't on purpose, that it was, it was, it was an atrocious tragedy, even to Lancelot, that these two young boys that he had knighted were now dead by his sword. And so he attempts to hide it from Gawain, and he has them buried before Gawain returns to court. Remember, he left because he refused to be a part. But he comes back, and um, Sir Mordred and his lackey knights are the first people to catch him. And they unfold the news immediately. Sir Lancelot killed your brothers, and they were unarmed. And Gawain, but my brothers loved Sir Lancelot. He was like a father to them. And he, Lancelot loved my brothers. How could this happen? Like, how could he kill them? And the, the dissonance of the love and the violence breaks Gawain. And he falls to his knees, and Arthur then comes into the room catching this in the act and he falls to his knees and he says where are their bodies i refuse to believe that they're dead show me their bodies and arthur says i've had them buried because i knew it would break you to see them i never wanted you to know what happened i never wanted you to know what happened and they weep together these two men And Gawain swears revenge on the, on the graves of his brothers, that he will be the one who kills Lancelot, that, that Lancelot will not live a life of peace as long as Gawain is alive. And then you can really, the structure is rended. The structure is rended. The, the fellowship of the round table has splintered, and Arthur laments it out loud. This is it. My fellowship is broken. The table round is cracked and will never be returned to its former glory. And so Gawain spurs Arthur to, to get a host of men together to go and attack the joyous guard and get the queen back and kill Lancelot. So they get thousands of knights on horseback and a small standing army, and they trudge across the land of Logrest to the Joyous Guard, trampling everything in their footpaths. Arthur's reign, which started out in chaos and bloodshed and entered into peace, is broken. So all of that peace that has descended upon the land, all of those nesting song songbirds and denning badgers and soaring eagles in their eyries are pushed by this force of revenge and violence coming out of the heart of peace at Camelot. And they push across the land to the, to the joyous guard and lay siege to it. And they lay siege to the castle for days and days and days. And not what every wave of fighting breaks against the castle walls. Breaks against the castle walls. Lancelot never leads his troops. For days and days, he never leads the knights in his command out of the castle. He never engages in open war warfare. Weeping and grieving to have to fight his own liege lord, his, his sovereign, his best friend. And the knights with Lancelot begin to rebel against that. It's like, they're, they're coming for us. <laughs> Let us fight. This is what we're for. Let us fight. This is what we're for. And the knights out with King Arthur are taunting them at the walls. And Lancelot comes out 
secretly under the cover of night with this gray, gray covered in gray, gray hood and finds Arthur alone with Gowan and says, I can't hold my knights back any longer. We, we, they want, they, 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 they demand to fight you. But I want you to know that I will not openly attack either of you. And I forced a, uh, an oath of protection upon the, you, the king, and you, Sir Gowan, that none of my knights will harm you. And if they find you down on the field, they will remove you. And, and then Sir Gowan says, uh, if I meet you on the field, you will die. I take your protection and I throw it away. If I meet you on the field, we will fight and you will die. And so Lancelot turns his horse around and goes home. And the next day he does indeed muster his entire force and take them out onto the battlefield. And they cut a bloody wedge through Arthur's army. They lay them waste. And at one time, Sir Bors, Lancelot's cousin, dishorses Arthur and grabs him by the hair and looks at Lancelot and says, I can end this war now. Let me end this war now. Let me kill this king. And Lancelot refuses and makes Bors put Arthur on his horse and send him back behind the line of the battle. And it goes on like this until King Arthur and Gowan's forces are completely pushed back by the, the forces of, of Lancelot. Completely decimated. News flies from that beta battlefield on Raven's Wing all the way to the Pope in Rome, who sends a missive to Arthur that says, if you don't, take forgive Guinevere and take away all besmirchment from her name. And if you don't forgive Lancelot, I will not only excommunicate you, but I will excommunicate the whole, excommunicate the whole of England from Christendom. You will be completely exiled from, from the love of God if you don't end this now. And that gets Arthur's attention. <laughs> And Sir Gawain spits on the missive. He says, I will kill this. There's nothing the Pope can say. And Arthur pulls him back like a dog on a chain. He's like, no, I'm a sovereign of a realm, not only my wounded heart. Stop what you're doing. Stop what you're doing. And so he heals. Gowan heals, and they send the missive across the wall to Lancelot, and he only too happily agreed. He didn't want to be fighting this war in the first place. And so they make a deal that in eight days, uh, he will bring Guinevere back to Camelot, and there will be this reunion. And he, and he says, there is more joy in returning Guinevere to you, King, to Arthur, than in ever taking her away. There's more joy in returning her to you. Because I did not take her by force. I took her to save her from the fire that you damned her to. And so it goes along as planned. In eight days, on the entrance on the gate of Camelot, you would have seen twelve knights dressed in white and green velvet on their horses, followed by 24 maidens in pure velvet dresses, all in this procession carrying olive branches, waving in the air, back and forth like this slow breeze, leading the fair and fellas, fame woman Guinevere and Lancelot back into the heart of things at Camelot. The slow, clomping progression of beauty across 
the defiled landscape of war back into the heart of things. This peace offering to rebuild a table that was broken, to reintegrate. And as Guinevere gets off of her, or her horse and returns to King Arthur's side, Gowan jumps again out from his, his uh, disciplined state <laughs> and demands that Lancelot be exiled across the water to Benwick, where he is from, from France. You must, be, you must leave the kingdom. If you don't, I'll kill you. And if you do leave the kingdom in 15 days, I will leave here and I will come to your kingdom and I will kill you on that soil out of the purview of Arthur. He's just chomping at the bit for the destruction of Lancelot. And King Arthur weeps to see this. He's weeping, weeping in this story. He's weeping all the time at this ending of his, of the majesty of his glory of this life it's all ending it's all falling apart and Lancelot willingly goes into exile willingly goes into exile and he says I'll even walk from here to the joyous guard and every 10 miles I will erect a hermitage and fill it with gold and dedicate it to the names of Sir Gareth and Sir Gaheris that I killed blindly every 10 miles between Camelot and the Joyous Guard. I will give away everything and dedicate it to the memory of your brothers. And this doesn't quell Gallen's rage. And so Lancelot goes into exile. He rides home. He indeed establishes all of these hermitages, giving away all of his gold. And when he gets home to the Joyous Guard, he tells all of his brothers and his cousins you can stay here and have all of my holdings in, in Logress. Stay here and live in your glory. Don't lose your place in this kingdom for me. I will go to, back to my family home in Benwick alone, and I will live out the rest of my life. And every single one of the hundred knights who's familiarly tied to Lancelot refuses to stay. They let his holdings in Logress fall to pieces, and they return with him across the water to Benwick to not be out of the orbit of the greatest knight in the world and their friend. And they set up their lives again there in France with this deep grief of exile and the broken bonds of kinship hanging over them. that they chose for love. And Sir Gowan made good on his promise. And he wormed his way into Arthur's ear with that dark speech of revenge. And Arthur mustered his army and took it across the water to France to continue the fight that he ended at the Pope's behest. And they never, at the beginning, they never openly attacked Lancelot's castle. They just started destroying every small castle they saw and burning villages and creating destruction, attempting to bait Lancelot and his men out of their castles to face them on open ground. And Lancelot again and again refused to ride into open battle against the king. That is my king. I'm here in France and I am the ruler of France, but that is my king. I refuse to fight him. I refuse to fight him. I refuse to fight him until one day they caught his ear with this. In your refusal to fight Arthur, you let the small folk of our country die. You let their lands be burned. You let their family heritages be snuffed out. In your refusal to do something, we pay no price and they pay it all. And so ride out, do something. You're the king, you're the king. You're the king. And so they engage, they somehow pull 
through small sorties, they pull Arthur's army to the castle of Kent Benwick, where again, a siege happens. And this time, they've learned the trick. They've learned the trick. And so Gawain goes out in front of the army and he says, enough, enough of sending our men against each other. I would need Sir, Sir Lancelot, you come out here and I will kill you and then it will be over. Fight me one on one. And Lancelot decides, well, I'll know I'll kill my friend. If I go out there, Gawain will die. Lancelot's pretty confident in the fact that he is the greatest swordsman in the world. So he sends his his cousin, Sir Bors, first, who rides against Gawain and is unhorsed. And then he sends another loyal knight. And every knight is unhorsed. This goes on every day. Around 9 a.m., Gawain rides up, calls out for Lancelot to come fight him, and then another knight is set out until Lancelot is, realizes he's the one who has to do it. This will never end. And so at 9 a.m., like clockwork, Gowan, like a big co, big crow, or big cock, a big rooster comes and starts strutting in front of the castle, calling out for, ba for battle and bloodshed. And this time Lancelot gets upon his most mighty horse and rides out to meet him. And as they begin to clash at 9 a.m., it's the forces of nature battling upon the field. Gawain and Lancelot, two of the greatest knights in all of the annals of history. And as Lancelot begins to tire an hour in, an hour and a half into this brutal bloodshed with the swords, that it's said that their armor is leaking blood and fertilizing the soil with their lifeblood as they spin in circles with their swords and fighting each other, that Gawain's strength rises and rises and rises as they get closer to noon. And as Lancelot's strength dwindles from the sheer exhaustion of fighting in this way, And as the noon hour rolls around, Lancelot feels it. He feels the power begin to dwindle as they get past noon. Slowly, but perceptibly, Gowan's power dwindles and Lancelot finally gets up the upper hand because he in, is indeed a better source, swordsman. And he strikes Lancelot. He slight strikes Gowan a blow that knocks him off the horse and leaves him wounded laying, having to be carried off the field. And weeks go by without a challenge from Gowan as he sits and is tended to and is healed. Until one morning at 9 a.m., Gowan shows up, healed from his wound. And again, the same thing happens. The forces of nature clashing on the field, the rising power of Gowan until noon, and then the, the falling. And Lancelot striking a lucky blow, a skilled blow and ending the battle. Weeks go by of healing, and on the third round, Lancelot calls him out. He says, I figured your trick, Gowan. I'm remembering now that when you were a young man, a hermit blessed you so that your power would rise with the rising sun. But when it reached its zenith, it would dwindle. I know, and you must remember that I am the better swordsman. So I will wait you out until noon, and then we'll end it like we always do. And Gowan's having none of it. He charges in. They fight. Same thing happens. The rising power. Lancelot now knows the trick. He's using less of his energy to bat away the blows that would have were crushing him for the months before. And the, Gowan's power begins to dwindle, and Lancelot strikes him on the helmet, cutting open his head biting down to the skull. And he's taken away back to be healed for the final time. And in watching this happen, the, the siege is diminished. 
Gowan is off the field. No one has the guts to fight. And into that, a raven flies with news that Sir Mordred, in the absence of King Arthur, has taken the throne of Logres and named himself king by falsely proclaiming that Arthur was dead on the battlefield in France and that he is planning to marry Queen Guinevere and take ultimate power over the kingdom. In this absence, in this following the revenge, following revenge to the end of the world, they opened up the destruction and the ending of Arthur's reign. And so Arthur and his men disappear in the, in the dead of night to return home. And Lancelot and his men sit in their castle and wait for the siege to continue because there's they disappear like ghosts home to go and deal with the festering at the heart instead of this revenge folly at the at the margins of the kingdom and it said that that Mordred, when he took power, when he made his overtures to Guinevere, that she pretended like she was going to go along with it from political savvy. <laughs> this is a woman who's been at the heart of things for a long time. She knows how it goes. She's the son. She's the daughter of a king and the husband of a king. Said, I know how this goes, and I'll survive if, if I at least seem like I'm going along with it. And she says to him, okay, you know, I mean, maybe, you know, if King Arthur's dead, I might, that might be okay, but I have to go to London first and get together the, all of the linens that I would need to be a wife. All the linens I would need for a marriage, the wedding dress and the sheets for the wedding bed and the curtains for the wedding chamber, all of these things that a bride in this, in this sort of, uh, romantic setting would be providing. And she disappears and she goes and musters a force of knights in London so that she is unassailable by Mordred. And Mordred follows her after, you know, she's gone, she disappears in the night, but he follows to London and he is accosted on the road to London by the Bishop of Canterbury. <laughs> this, like, you know, the head honcho of, of religiosity in this, in this kingdom accosts him on the road and says, Mordred, what you're doing is unlawful. First of all, we all know that you're actually Arthur's son and not Arthur's nephew. That you were begot between Arthur and his wife and his sister, Morgan, in some strange play of Eros beyond the confines of what we think is okay in this country. Second of all, that means you're trying to wear, marry your father's wife and you're attempting to steal the kingdom from a king that we all know is alive. And if you do not desist from your actions, I will curse you with book and bell and candle and you will be striked down by the almighty God. <laughs> so we've got this bishop just pulling down some serious sorcerous magic. It's like, if you don't stop doing this, I know how to end you, and I will do it. And Mordred spits in his face and disregards the threat of an old religious man And, the bishop, and threatens to kill the bishop. If you ever come near me again, you will die. If you remain in Canterbury, you will die. And so the bishop of Canterbury goes and becomes a hermit in hiding and prays every day with book and bell and candle for the destruction of Mordred, for the, for the divine intercession of his God to end this folly. Arthur returns. And a great war begins between the forces that are still loyal to Arthur and the forces that have changed over to Mordred's side, including 
uncountable numbers of mercenaries from Scandinavia, from Frisia, which is uh, Denmark, or yeah, Denmark, and also Scandinavian mercenaries. And these, and this battle begins between the new order of that Mordred represents and the old order that that Arthur represents. And it's clear that Arthur's still alive when he arrives with all of his knights. But the people are caught in the middle of a sovereign like Arthur, who they have been told by Mordred brought nothing but chaos and destruction through his folly of t seeking revenge on Lancelot. In the twisting of the words, they soon forgot the peace of Camelot and the promises of Mordred to restore order and peace and festivities to the land. And they're stuck in the middle. And battles rage and the battles rage and there's uncountable battles written in the, in, in the source text. But on the eve of a battle at Cam Land, Arthur is struck by a dream. He's struck by a dream. And he's sitting on a raised pavilion on his throne. And the pavilion is covered by, by silks. And at his feet is a well, deeper than memory, deeper than time. And swimming around in the well are dragons and worms and wild beasts. And as he's looking into the well, the, the, the patio, the pavilion that he's sitting on is lifted by some force and he's dumped into the well where he is then dragged and ripped and rended by dragons and wild beasts. And then he is visited by a voice that tells him if he goes and fights against Mordred that day, that he will die. If you go out and fight this day, you will die. And when he awakes in the morning, he's haunted by this dream. But still possessed by the lust of war and goes out upon the field. goes out upon the field. And it is said in this battle that the men, they fought like demons and blood rained upon the land. And all the knights who we once held in esteem earned their valor, but also earned their meed, as they say, died. Gawain died on that field. And with his last words, forgave Lancelot and sent a message with a page across the water to France. Tell Lancelot about what happened here. Tell him I forgive him. Tell him I'm sorry. And tell him to come and save England. Because we're all going to die. And Gowan, was, and Gowan died on the field there. And the bloodshed continued, and at the heart of it, at the final moment, Mordred, arrayed in his black armor, met Arthur. And Arthur has Exc had Excalibur in his hand. And they fought to bloody death there. Arthur stabbing Mordred through the center with a spear at the final moment. Just as Mordred's sword came slicing through the air and deep and cut into Arthur's skull, his crown falling to the ground. And they died there in this bloody embrace, this intimacy of violence. They both fell, Mordred on top of Arthur. And with his dying breath, Arthur gave his sword to one knight named Bedivere and said, go and throw this into the lake. Return it to where it came from, Excalibur the sword of the Lady of the Lake, return it to where it came from. And Bedivere goes, and he's standing at the edge of the lake, 
looks at the sword and can't do it, so he hides the sword in a tree and goes back to Arthur and says, and Arthur says, what did you do with the sword? Uh, I threw it in the lake. Well, what happened? Well, nothing. The sword splashed into the lake. My liege, you know, you're dying. Why are you asking me about this? He says, no, go back. I know you didn't do it. <laughs> so Bedivere goes back. He takes the sword out of the tree, looks at it, starts to throw it, uh, puts it under a rock. He goes back to Arthur. Arthur says, what did you do this time? He said, I threw the sword in the lake. What happened? Oh, nothing. It just splashed into the lake. I know you didn't do it. I know you didn't do it. Go back. Do it this time, Bedivere. This is a long death. He's bleeding out. I don't understand. So Bedivere goes again to the edge of the water, grabs the sword, and finally throws it into the water. And as it sails through the air, sparkling, a hand all wrapped in white samite, which is white silk from the Middle East, comes out of the water, glistening, and grabs the sword and waves it three times in the air before sucking it back into the lake. And then Bedivere weeps and returns to Arthur, and the tears are attestation enough to that it happened. And so Arthur asks Bedivere to remove Mordred from on top of him and carry him down to the water. I don't know why he couldn't go at the same time as the sword, but for some reason, now he was ready. And as he's going down to the sword, he says, the women from Avalon are coming. I hear them already. They're coming for me to heal my wounds. They're coming for me to heal my wounds. And as they come down to the water, Bedivere sees it, a barge slowly being rowed across the water with 12 women with black hoods covering their faces, skirting through the mist across the water. And when their black hooded faces spy the dying king in the, in the arms of Bedivere, they, be, they let out a piteous dull, is what it says. And maybe it sounded something like this. came scraping onto the shore. Arthur was put in it <clears throat> and taken to that island of the apples in the west where some people will tell you he still waits to return in the time of greatest need. And on that spot, there, next to that water, they erected a hermitage. 
and a tomb, and in golden letters emblazoned and on the tomb was written, Here lies Arthur, the once and future king. Here lies Arthur, the once and future king. And so that age of Camelot crumbled and ended and fell into the shadow of memory and into texts that we leave on shelves and often forget to crack open. And that is the end. Hmm. So those of you who are um, old pros of hanging out with stories of me, we're going to just gonna invite uh, the new folks into this practice. So the, the practice is uh, called feeding the story. And I, and I learned this from, from my teacher, Dr. Martin Shaw. Um, and he, I think, learned it from Danny Deardorff, who is a mythologist and friend of, um, of Martin's, who died in 2019, um, who, his work is incredible. His book called The Other Within is kind of one of the like tomes of my work and um, deeply indebted to it. And so this practice of feeding the story really comes from this idea that that stories are alive, that the, the beings in them are not characters, they're people, that the places in them are not um, landscapes or settings, they're places. The, for it, the trees in them are not uh, doodles of, of trees. They're real trees that need water and sunlight and air to survive. And, um, and that a good story is like good food. It nourishes us in a way and it nourishes our bodies in a, in, 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 in a way like food or drink. And in that in an act of reciprocity, stories need to be nourished as well. And one way we can nourish them is by reflecting back to them in words, with language, with the spirit of our bodies and our breath, um, something in them that moved us, some, some image that is staying with us. And I often say in my work of story that the, the whole story is too big to walk away with, but there's one thing that got, that floated its way into your body or stuck you like an acupuncture needle. Um, and the practice is to feed that back to the circle, to the story, to the ancestors, to all the gathered beings. Um, so I'll just open a space now for anyone on Zoom to unmute themselves and offer back that, that reciprocity to the story. And my friends here in the room may do so. And I'll maybe repeat so that it can be a reciprocal hearing. Hmm. My mom says the sparks of the anvil when Lancelot and Guinevere meet. The image of two young men setting down their swords to walk Guinevere to their death. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the unarmed Gareth and Gary's Setting, yeah, walking Guinevere to her death. The, the raven arriving to call Arthur home. Mm. The raven arriving to call Arthur back to England. Yeah, I would say the, um, uh, the, uh, women of Avalon coming across the waters in the mist mm -hmm. to heal Arthur. Mm -hmm. yeah. Women from Avalon coming to heal, coming through the mist. 
for me, uh, something that really just moved me was when you said uh, Lancelot and Guinevere when Arthur went hunting, I believe, uh, when Lancelot came to the chambers, it wasn't clear whether they had ever kissed before. And so this whole construct is, it's a mystery as to whether it was um, over something that was fantasy or something that was real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the beauty of life for me and the, mm -hmm. and the, and the, and the agony of life. Mm -hmm. it's the unknown of, of what we're fighting for and what's real. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Mm. Hmm. I think I'm really struck by the imagery of landscape that really comes to me, thinking of, you know, um, battles on fields and the, the heart of Camelot and the castles and this imagery that comes along with these tales that also in my mind becomes this absolute real landscape that I wonder where I've seen it before mm -hmm. when I'm able to pull it up again mm -hmm. in my mind. In a movie perhaps, but it is still belonging to a place and I'm brought there mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. the, the images. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the transportation to like real place through stories that like gets called up and we don't really know where it's from. <laughs> like a movie or we're like, well, how do we know to see that? That's the magic right there. The um, silken white hand mm. reaching out of the lake to retrieve the, to catch the sword that had endured so much that then brought the tears out of Bedouin, I think. Uh, Bedivere. Bedivere. Yeah, that Arthur just knew. And just that, that grief and that ending. Um, and also cursing with book and bell and... <laughs> Candle was a fun image. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's laid out here in the world. And um, so there's this practice that sometimes I, I forget to do. And then I get my uh, the elves, the elves that are my wife come to me and say, you know, Probably should have done it. So I'll invite you into it. Um, this is a practice I learned from Martin. Um, so you, in your hands, you imagine that uh, you have golden apples. And you hold these golden apples. And actually in the center, hovering above your heart, there's also a golden apple. You've got three. You're, you're very wealthy in apples. <laughs> and um, this apple that is this golden apple that's in your right hand that's the story's apple that's the one that we're gonna when 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 i say time you're gonna chuck over your sorry right hand yes over your left shoulder you're gonna chuck it into the imaginal realm you're just, and you're, you know that last little dose it's like the the paper paper thin wafer that the story needs to be really full and and this other one this this other golden apple you've got in your left hand that, that's you're going to give that to me as an a gift of reciprocity of like to bless the teller and this golden apple you've got in the middle well that's your golden apple that's not going anywhere ever you can't give it away even if you wanted to it belongs to you and you get to eat from it and be nourished at all times 
Um, so you can you can you can you know put my apple down in some sacred way in your in your house in your Zoom, and I'll come find it in Dreamland. And this other apple on the count of three, we're gonna throw it over our shoulder and just give that story the last thing that it really needs. One, two, three. We do that so that we may not be eaten, <laughs> so that something else will be eaten instead of us tonight, at least. Um, I'm so grateful for you all for coming, my new faces and friends from Kinhood. Thank you so much for integrating the spaces. And thank you, family. Thank you, Scott, who is family. Thank you, Ukiah you, family. And I'll uh, see you in December for the grand finale. <laughs> Be well, sweet dreams. Uh, Hi, thank you. Thank you so much, Chase. Also, incredible singing as well. Just incredible wanna... singing. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank yes that's my wife, Kiara. She's an incredible singer. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, y'all. Good night, family. You're muted. I think I need to go to bed.